So for those that come to me and they're saying, well, if this was so easy, we'd all have it already. I'd suggest there's some people out there that are making damn sure that this isn't so easily available. And, you know, prior to the internet, it was easy, right? If you had onesie twosie people, it's easy to shut up onesie twosie people. I mean, the good thing about the power of the internet is, you know, a thousand people could be coming in parallel doing the same thing at the same time. That's going to be a little harder to shut up. And maybe we'll actually make some progress forward after, well, more than 100 years now. Hey everybody, my name is Brenda Stoudemire. I work in the Wisconsin water industry and I have a passion for human health and the environment. And one of my curiosities is alternative energies that are suppressed or we don't really hear that much about from the mainstream media. So today we're going to be sitting down with Mark Cooper to talk about vapor fuels and how we can get our vehicles to get 100 to 200 miles per gallon. Mark, can you please give us a little introduction to who you are? Sure. Uh, Mark Cooper. I've been doing various, uh, I guess you could say, alternative energy things since early 2000s. Um, I've got a lot of different videos throughout the years, uh, most of them about 10 years ago, actually. Uh, that's out on my uh, YouTube channel. It's uh, listed under Cisco Cracker, but it's spelled S-I-S-Q-O-C-R-A-C-K-E-R, -S -E Cisco Cracker, all together one word. Um, it may be buried. You might have to scroll down after putting that specific name in because um, I've been shadow banned on YouTube since 2013. Um, that's whenever I started promoting the fumes uh, kind of thing. Thought I was going to build a kit and actually uh, sell these things. And then over about a four-year period, uh, discovered the nasty truth about it and how could somebody be so naive as I was, but people still are. So so I had seen um, a video, how, how it got started for me. I seen a video on YouTube from this guy and he called himself Sunny Five Rising at the time on YouTube. He's since changed his name. He since pulled the video down and I understand why. I've uh, been through these things myself. Um, so on his video, he's got this old uh, AC, uh, um, sorry, air compressor. Uh, that was a Briggs and Stratton, like three and a half horsepower gas motor or something. Um, and he had it all taken apart, you know, uh, so he could refurbish it, clean up the rust and all that, repaint it. And uh, while he had the engine off, he had his own workbench stand. And he's like, hey, you know, I've seen these guys doing the fumes thing. And I thought, you know, maybe I could try that out. And then he shows what he does. And he's got a one inch uh, T, like a, a regular plumbing NPT, you know, one inch um, metal T. Uh, and then a couple of half inch reducing bushings and then a couple of half inch hoses and then a ball valve and then another ball valve on each hose that's going off from the T. Um, one is just out into the air and the other one goes off into the top of a little gas can for fumes. And then, of course, you can't have that gas can just sucking the fumes out. You have to also allow air back into it. So he also cut another hole for another half inch pipe. And what you do is you only have about an inch of fuel at the bottom. And he just ran the hose down through there until it broke the level of the fuel. So as air is coming in, it's bubbling the fuel. And that's why people call it a bubbler. Helps agitate the fuel and keep the fumes coming. Um, so as a proof of concept and to prove it happens, you've got your two ball valves uh, to the air and to the fuel. So, and this is an air fuel mix already, right? Because it's pulling air into the fumes canister. So uh, you just kind of dial that for air fuel ratio. And, um, you know, pull up, pull the rip cord and fires right up. Um, and I seen that and I thought, wow, that was extremely simple. <laughs> like, it can't be that easy, right? But, it, you know, like a lot of people think, oh, if it's that easy, we'd all be doing it by now. Yeah, well, you'd like to think that. Um, we would all like to think that. So uh, what wound up happening was um, I thought about it for a second. I'm like, wait, I got a, a single cylinder generator outside. I could fire that up. Um, what else do I have laying around? So I looked and um, I thought, wait, I'm going to go to a website and get a bill of materials. And I'm actually going to put together enough parts that I can do what that guy did, um, even though I've got a shop and there's lots of things there. I'm like, how much would it cost somebody to just go out on a weekend and do this real quick on a generator, for example? And um, I went to the GEET, uh, G-E-E-T uh, website, and I found a uh, bill of materials for a similar device, but that thing is more complicated. It does have a lot more going on than just fumes. Um, but I thought, well, you know, I, I can at least get my stuff together so I don't miss anything. So I got the T, the half inch, uh, reducing bushings, the pipe, the hose clamps, the hose barbs, uh, ball valves, you know, all the little pieces parts. And so I made a list. I went to Lowe's Home Improvement, spent $82 buying every little thing that I could possibly need, um, came back home, 
assembled it onto the generator in place of the carburetor. So initially, I didn't even have the carburetor. I just jammed the one inch T right against the head on the motor. And uh, second pull, fired right up. Now that generator hadn't been running in three years, probably before that. Part of the reason it wasn't running was because of all that fuel in the fuel bowl of the carburetor getting varnished and getting all clogged up and stuff. And I was like, well, I won't need it on this thing if I can give that a try. But within five hours, from the time I watched the guy's video on YouTube and sourced the parts, went to the store, came back, put it all together, fired it up. Five hours later, I'm running a generator on fumes. And then that was it for me. And at the time, I had a Chevy Volt. <laughs> so I'm like, who cares about electric car if you get to hear a V8 running, you know, 100 miles per gallon, 200 miles per gallon. Um, depends on how you're doing it, uh, how much power you want and flows and all this stuff. We can get into it in another video. But um, that's that's what really what did it for me. So then, um, you know, within a month of that time, I'd done several things. I went from firing up the generator. A week later to the day, I started a V8 on the, on the stand. Um and then I started researching and I created 100 MPG Motors LLC. And I started researching like there must be patents out there, right? This was so quick and easy. And I wondered about the Pogue carburetor a little bit more than I knew already. I wondered about Tom Ogle and his stuff a little more than I knew already. So then I started deep diving all these things. And back then on Google, you could go to patent or patents.google.com, I forget which, um, and then type in, you know, what your search terms are. And, you know, everybody back in the day used to use search terms differently with quotes and plus and whatnot to kind of assemble your best prompt engineering, they would call it now with OpenAI, um, to get the best result. And then it returned to me um, after I did some more filtering and, and knocking other things out of it. It returned to me 964 patents. Now, this is December 2012 at the time. Kind of funny timing wise that it happened. And then um, December 2012, I looked up the patents. The oldest one I found was 1912. That guy was 205 miles per gallon on a Model T or Model A, whatever it was. It was, you know, old school four-cylinder guy, probably only did 35 miles an hour, big pistons. Uh, but these things need to be torque motors. They're not high horse, high RPM motors anyway. So that was perfect for that environment. But the guy built the setup. He had a little pint uh, whiskey bottle hanging from a little wire coat hanger he made on his front flat windshield, you know, the flat plain glass windshields were at the time. And he just hung that pint of fuel over and he ran it down into his system that were kind of like a bubbler did um it, it, it would agitate the fuel and it would put the heat into it and, it, and you got to keep the heat coming into it right because it's a uh, hydrocarbon fuel it's a solvent it's sitting in a vacuum path it wants to freeze so it takes a lot of heat to overcome it freezing even more heat to actually bring the liquid fuel up to a gaseous state uh, especially with all the olefins and paraffins and stuff that's in the fuel that you know there's hardly any gasoline in our gasoline there's a lot of other stuff in there um, and, and that's the tough part, right? But anyway, the guy made it work, you know, they ran out the pint of fuel, they did the calculations, worked out to be 205 miles per gallon. Uh, and within two weeks, uh, he wasn't talking about it anymore. He owned the nicest gas station on the corner in the busy little town he lived in. Um, you know, here's your nice little gas station, you know, quit talking about it, basically. Um, and, and you'll see that story repeat throughout history if, if you look into these stories. Anyhow, out of the 964 patents, I started flipping through them. I thought, well, well, there must be a lot of other trash in here. I must have to filter out more. But all of the ones that I could spot check, and I must have looked through 40 or 60 patents probably out of all those patents, and I would read through them enough to realize a lot of these are doing the same thing um, overall, right? You know, some have a little more interesting ways of doing it or not. But most, most cases, the absolute majority of the cases, you have what happens in an oil refinery. That's really what's going on, right? So you've got um, in an oil refinery, you have a stack. And in that column, uh, down near the bottom uh, where the lower temperature heat's applied uh, to the light sweet crude oil, um, you know, it's just a hydrocarbon chain, but it's a very long, complex hydrocarbon chain. And so as you go up the stack and you put in more heat, you get varying types of fuel from it. So near the bottom, you got like kerosene and diesel and JP4. You know, they come up the stack and you got like gasoline, different flavors, you got av gas for aviation, um, you know, 110 octane, what have you. You get up near the top of the stack and now up there you've got like um, white gas, like what used to be used in the Coleman lanterns back in the day where they just glow real bright, uh, kind of an invisible flame kind of fuel. Um, and all that's happening is you're you're increasing the temperature and it's making the hydrocarbon chain shorter and shorter. And you do eventually get it to where it becomes a gaseous state. Um, so that's basically what all these guys were doing, right? They had liquid fuel on board. They'd run it through some kind of heat process. Um, they would jack it up to the point that it was gaseous. 
and then it only blend in as much air as needed for that air fuel ratio. Um, and that's the thing that kind of gets a lot of people that air fuel ratio is important um, because they uh, think, well, you're running really lean. Well, no, I've actually run things on fumes so rich I killed the motor, which is a good thing because if you can kill a motor being rich, you can either add more air or you can pull the fumes back. In either case, you're going to get more performance. You're going to get more efficiency, um, you know, because those things go always go hand in hand. You'll see a lot of uh, really well-designed engines that have a lot of horsepower. They're actually very efficient. Um, so, you know, the idea that all these sports cars running around get terrible gas mileage, some of that um, may be by design. Uh, I had a 71 Corvette, uh, I'm sorry, a 90 model Corvette ZR1 um, that was about 400 horse and it got 29 miles to the gallon on the highway all the time. And that was 1990 vehicle, right? Um, that was back at the same time, 89. We had that Honda CRX HF that was running around. It was a 1.5 liter, I believe it was. Um, that thing was uh, 52 miles to the gallon, nothing special from Honda, you know? And then over the years, you see them doing all these other things where we're not doing as good as we did in the late 80s, early 90s uh, when it comes to fuel efficiency, you know, for public to be able to see. Um, there's other things that we've done that's been way more efficient than that, but it doesn't make it to the public eye. In looking up the patents and um, finding that there was about 964 patents, apparently over a hundred year period from 1912 to 2012, I got to thinking about that as well. It was like, wait, that's 9.6 patents a year for a hundred years. We still don't have this technology. Somebody's serious about us not having it. So for those that come to me and they're saying, well, if this was so easy, we'd all have it already. I'd suggest there's some people out there that are making damn sure that this isn't so easily available. And, you know, prior to the internet, it was easy, right? If you had onesie twosie people, it's easy to shut up onesie twosie people. I mean, the good thing about the power of the internet is, you know, a thousand people could be coming in parallel doing the same thing at the same time. That's going to be a little harder to shut up. And maybe we'll actually make some progress forward after well more than a hundred years now.